I think so. We good? Yeah, I'm going to mute myself here. Okay. All right, well, I'm glad we got this finally worked out. We're going to talk a little bit about whaling in New England. <clears throat> there are two pictures that you have in front of you right now. One is just a romantic picture of a whale, of whaling. Um, when you think of whaling, it's a, it's a beautiful picture. I'm sure many of you have gone on whaling trips and you see the majestic view of a whale. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. The picture on your left is the Essex. We'll talk more about the Essex. It was a ship. This is an actual whaling ship that went out. It's actually a precursor of Moby Dick, precursor of the white whale. The Essex was an actual whaling ship that was crushed by a whale um, in real time. 24 men went, wound up on an island and they had to, uh, they had no food. They eventually re resorted to cannibalism. Melville found out about that story and Melville actually wrote a book, a Melville book partially on the, on the results of the, of the Essex. I'm gonna talk more about the Essex later. So we do know that the uh, Vikings and the best were some of the earliest people who used the whaling industry. Uh, Vikings basically were, you know, a big sailor. They went all around the world, basically. They were here on the North Continent, North America. There's evidence of, of Leif Erikson being here in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and possibly here in New England. Uh, we also know that the best, between the years of 700 to the year 1000, the best in Europe uh, were heavily into whaling. Um, what the best did, this is like when with the very Catholic, if you remember Europe, of course, was very Catholic in the 70, 900s. And during Lent, nobody could eat meat on Friday. So that's what the best really did. They went out and they, they, they captured what they call the, the capois, the old French word for heavy meat. It's really um, blubber, really blubber meat. So we do know that the Vikings were, they, they did some well, and we also know that the, the best, that's actually an engraving on the right of a best fishing expedition. I think it's romanticized a little bit, but they uh, doesn't look like doesn't look like a whale to me, but nonetheless, they say it was a whale. All right, let's talk about the various types of whale. There are many types of whale. When sailors went out to catch a whale, they always wanted to get a sperm whale, or a, definitely a whale that had a great deal of oil connected to it. And the biggest ones would be the sperm whale. Even today in France, I call them cachalot, which is a French word for a sperm whale. The blue whale is the largest mammal in the world. Sometimes they're 100 feet in length. Um, the right whale, the reason the right whale got their name, by the way, because when, when, once they began realizing this was the whale to catch, they said, this is the right whale. So it actually comes from the, from the term used by the, by the whaling industry. The sandback and the humpback, these are all shorter types of whales, but they are, they're, all, they're all usable for, for whaling. Now, some of the physical features of the whale, um, they are the largest of the mammals. Their head and brain sometimes can be, as the head alone can be up to 20 pounds. Uh, they're able, capable of diving to the deepest part of the ocean. They can go underwater for over an hour. Their skin has a thickness of over 14 inches. Um, so it's a very heavy, heavy animal. But they're, as, as I mentioned, they're really majestic as, as we know and see about the whale. One thing that's always surprised me is that the whale is considered to be a mammal. We're in the same species as human beings. And they're the same. And then the three main reasons of what mammals share, they give birth live, which mammals and human beings do. They have very large lung capacity and they need to breathe air. So even though we think of a whale as being a, a, a sea life, an aquatic creature, which it is, it's really heavy. It's a really a, a bi uh, location. It really has both features. It has lungs, it does have lungs, and they can take deep breaths of air, they need to breathe, and take an oxygen above, above the water, and they hold on to it, then they dive down, and they go deep into the, into the ocean. And the mothers also provide milk to their young. So it's, it's kind of an amazing thing, but they're the same species as, as human beings. We do note that the Native American Indians also, even before the uh, Europeans came to America, they did some whaling. They were the, the Shinnecock tribe, which is in Montauk, had a ceremony they called Padawe. Also, we know the Aquina Indians in, in Martha's Vineyard, they also did that. Um, the religious, it was a, really a ceremony. So what would happen is the head of the tribe would go out on a small boat. He would kind of corral the whale or stop him from moving forward if he could. And then a number of small boats would go around him and they would entail him with, with rope and, and then eventually cull and pull the, and drag the uh, whale to shore. 
So the, as they were doing that, they would be singing songs and doing celebrations. And then finally, when they arrived on land, it was about a week long celebration. They used to celebrate, the Native Americans would celebrate the, the capturing of the whale. So who made up the crew once whaling became popular? Well, we do know that for the most part, from the beginning of the 1700s, he really began, uh, Nantucket was really the first big center for whaling. 1692 was when they had a fellow named Jonah Paddock, who was a Yarmouth man, went over to Nantucket. He was hired by them. Nantucket wanted to get the whaling industry uh, going. And they hired him to train people to, to, to do whaling. Um, most of the people in the very beginning were slaves. I'd say a typical whaling boat would be 20 to 24 people in the early 1700s. I'd say probably four or five were white. They would be the, the mates, the first mate, second mate, captain. Um, many of them would be slaves. The way that would work, many of the northern people who had slaves would allow their slaves to go on board on a ship. And two things would happen. One, there would be a commission paid to the owner. And then as well, on top of that, the um, Sometimes the slaves would give them like a reduction in their, in their um, servitude. So perhaps that maybe they could reduce two, four years of their, whatever their bond and indebtedness call for, for, for serving. Um, the Wampanoags also were very big. I'd say probably more than half of this, the crew at that time would be the, the, the indigenous people, the Wampanoags. The Wampanoags, they, they were living in Mashpee, most of them. And they would get food from the store for their mother, for their father, you know, the, the Europeans were very glad to give uh, food to them. And the way they did that is saying, here's an IOU. And so what they would do then, they would then recruit the sons, saying, you owe us X amount of dollars, X amount of sons. And to pay that off, we want your son to work on the ship. So the poor son really didn't have much of a, much of a choice. Once they went on board, they were pretty much there for a long period of time. Most of these whaling crews at that point in time, sometimes it could be as little as a month or two months, Sometimes as long as four or five years, but a lot of times they, they recruited them to do even longer periods of time. Let's talk about why we, why are whales so important? So I'm going to give you some of the backgrounds for why whaling was such a big uh, product in, in New England throughout the world. So almost every inch of the whale was used one way or another for different things. The baleen with that, that little meshy stuff that kind of looks like, like fibers up above the mouth of the whale. That is a filtering system. They would make crops, like uh, writing crops. They could make dolls' tails, uh, wigs. They could do a lot of things with, with the baleen. They used the vertebrae and the ribs of a whale. They could actually carve. Sometimes some was a little pliable. It wasn't not, not, not great, not very pliable, but a little bit. And they could carve or they could shape things. So they could make furniture on occasion. They could do chess pieces. I remember the kid, I remember having a chess piece made, made out of um, the whale bone. I remember having that myself. Whale oil, this is the real big one. The whale oil is made from the blubber of the whale. We mentioned that the thickness of the skin is 18, 19 inches in, uh, thick. And they would boil that. And that's what is made from the sperm. The sperm oil became used for many, many things. For lamps and kerosene, that was the big use. I remember the, the 1700s, this was how people lit their homes. They had candles, of course. But without candles, they also used the sperm oil to, you know, with a wicker tape to, uh, for their lamps. Chanel actually used, Chanel number no. five used this whale oil in their, in their perfume. You could mix whale oil with tar and oakum and you can get a caulking compound. Ambergris, which is part of sperm oil, would also be used for general health purposes. They say if you had tuberculosis or a bad cough, many of the people would take whale oil. So you can see it became very expensive um, and a great demand for it too. The other part of the whale, spermaceti, it's a waxy substance located in the head of the whale. And from there, they could do coloring and dyes. You see the, you know, once the textiles became big, like in Lawrence and Lowell and throughout America, um, that's how they dyed. They used this particular product to, uh, to give color to the, to the different textiles. This particular spermaceti also gave buoyancy. The reason why they call the right, right whale the correct whale, because it was very buoyant. Even though once they speared it and destroyed it or however they did it, um, it would rise to the top. So it was, was a very fluent, uh, buoyant substance that would be there. They say this is very good for the highest too. So I have not tried it, but I know it, you can do it for them. The shampoo is made from that too. Sorry, so every single inch of the whale had a purpose. So once they captured a whale, um, it had, had a value, it had a great financial value connected to it. There's different kinds of whaling. So let's talk about the different kinds of whaling. 
the first cod whaling in New England would be called drift whaling. So every now and then, just by sheer luck, a whale would be coming on to the, you know, to the shore. And every town in Cape Cod, I did some research, every, every town, Yarmouth and Dennis in particular, all of them actually, had a rules about what happened if you found a whale on your property. <laughs> you found whales in, uh, on the ocean. And they actually had to pay a tax. So in theory, what would happen if a large fish came on board on, onto the ocean shore, um, there was, you could claim it. If you, couldn't commute, if you couldn't immediately get rid of it, like a small whale, the one on the right is a pilot whale, that probably wouldn't be of value because that's a very small creature. But if a larger whale became on board, um, they would have to report it to the town. And then the town would say, we get 50%, you get 50%. So whatever the div division would be, the town would, would decide what it could be. The one exception to that, Native Indians could not do it, except in, in Mashpee. There was a provision of the Mashpee because the Wampanoas were so active in whaling. They did allow the Wampanoas if a whale should happen to come up on the, the shore in, in Mashpee. So as I mentioned before, Nantucket was very active in uh, training people how to do whaling. 1690s when um, Mr. Paddock went to Nantucket to train. And originally it was only five people or so that he trained, but from there they trained a few other people. Nantucket was looking, they figured they had no other way of making a living, so they, they came upon the idea of let's say let's do fishing, and in particular whaling would be the way we could do, we could make the industry work. This is a drawing, by the way, of supposedly that is Paddock there. I don't know if that's, doesn't look like this. Clothing didn't look appropriate to me, but. So in the beginning, there are, in the beginning, there are three kinds of ways they would do well. Well, um, on your screen, you might see three, you might see the big ship on the bottom and they have a whale that's connected to the side. So once they speared or harpooned the whale, they were able to, you know, gather it in, pull it to the boat. If they didn't have on board a try, a try is like a big um, boiling pot. If they could boil the rubber and dispose of the body right there, that would be the most efficient way to do it. But up until about the year 1820, tries were not very popular on boats. They had a few of them, which meant that most of the people who were whaling prior to 1820 would gather a whale, bring it back to the shore, dispose of it, do what they had to do with it, and then take all the products that they could from the whale itself. Um, and so that's one way to do it. Now, if they had a try on the ship, and I hope you can see there's a little like a furnace like on a ship, if they can dispose of the whale there, then they can go on longer trips. Then they could do two, three, four, five whales at a time, which is really cost efficient, time efficient. So that would be the better way of doing it. So then it's called a herd, or a third way of doing it is they can guide whales to the shore. Sometimes the they were so prolific, the whales, at the beginning of the 1700s, that they could just have ships come out and guide them in. But that's not true anymore. As you know, the whales are now, especially the right whales, uh, an endangered species. Um, it's getting better, by the way. They're saying that they are becoming more, a little more noticeable, but still an endangered species. So this is what a try was, what a town try was. Every town in Cape Cod, Dennis, Yarmouth, and so on, would have blubber. They would have try -work. So if you caught a whale, you would have to bring it to this place, and they usually charge a fee, and the fee was pretty heavy, because they did all the heavy lifting, so to speak. The people who lived near it, they said the smell was tremendous. They say that the odor from this thing would probably last for probably a month if it was from the last whale. So I wouldn't want to be the neighbor of one of these uh, production factories here. But every town in Cape Cod had a salt works, every town had a tri works. So if they captured whales, they would bring it into their local town, or maybe they had an agreement with another tri work and they would, they would secure the whale and they would, they would process the meat there. Now, careers in whaling, actually, when you think about them, will go, went way beyond just the sailors and the captain themselves. There are many people involved with whaling. You have the builders of the boat. Um, Dennis had a real big boat yard. Coopers, people who do, you know, barrels. Uh, the weavers, the sail weavers, um, food preparation, the dry, dry tack or food that would go out when they went uh, whaling for long periods of time, carpenters, traders. So the picture on the right, this actually showed some of the industry in New Bedford in about 1830. These are actual uh, drawings of a picture of what, they're all connected, they're not directly, but they are connected with the whale, whale industry in one way or another. When the whaling came in for the winter, came in, you would see 
the men would repair the bottom of the boat. They would do, uh, you know, have to tie that. So a lot of times, much of the work would be done almost on a year-round basis for the, for the whaling industry. So to show you how much whaling grew, particularly in Nantucket, you will cover like a 30-year period here. In 1715, Nantucket had only six whaling ships. By 1745, they had 60 ships, 60 whalers. They would get 600 barrels, 1715, to 11,000 barrels 30 years later. 15 captains versus 85 captains. Um, you could see that more than half of the island was engaged in some form of whaling in one way or another by the year 1745. So clearly Nantucket was kind of a leader. The picture, by the way, there shows Nantucket, I think at the year, it's like 18 something, later 1800, but you can see all the whale ships in there. Because that's even, even then, not now, but then with less. One of the first really big whaling captains was a fellow named Benjamin Bangs. He lives in Brewster. And he has a log, he kept a log, you can read it, I was lucky enough to read a little bit of his log. Um, it goes from 1742 to 1762, 20 year period. He himself was trained by Jonas Paddock, and he in turn trained other people. He had a slave, and he had a few of his slaves actually go on board and do some of the whaling with, um, with, with seemed to be very fair. Now, the natives was very interesting because the natives were not treated fairly once they became on board. The slaves were. Once a slave became on a, on a whaling ship, the slaves were given almost like equal status to any other sailor. So the whites and the, and the blacks and the, the slaves were kind of given equal. The, the, the native indigenous people, a little different. The indigenous people were not treated not quite as fairly. They were dangerous. They, they, were, they did all the dangerous jobs too. They did all the things that they, um, the white men didn't want to do. It was interesting too, because I read in a 30 year period, uh, I think it was something like 120 indigenous people were hurt on whaling ships, and I think two, two uh, European descended people were hurt in that time period. Now, once it became a little bit bigger, the, the whaling industry from about 1750, a little bit later, um, spread a little bit. So, Wellesley became involved, and Pro uh, Provincetown became involved to a small degree. Provincetown became much more involved about the year 18, after the Civil War, say 1865, around there. There till about 1910, um, Provincetown became the kind of, the, I'll not say the, the head, but a very popular whaling percentage. So uh, you can see uh, Wellesley had a little harbor and they, they can come out from the side there. And they, um, that became a very heavy center for whaling. On a percentage basis, more than half the town of Wellesley at that point in time was involved with whaling. So it was a big industry for the, the people of Wellesley at that point in time as well. Now, once the American Revolution came along, that changed a lot in the whaling industry. So one of the things that would happen if an American sailor or army, either military person was captured, he was given one of three choices. He could go to prison, a military prison, go to jail if he was captured. He could join the British Navy, and many people didn't want to do that. Or he could join the British whaling companies. And the British, all of a sudden, the British became very heavy into whaling, right around the Revolutionary War period. Prior to that, the Britons did not much at all in terms of whaling. But at that point, once the war broke out, they said, there's money to be made here. And they realized that. So people would do different things and, and support the British town. Um, interesting to read, too, that in just during the Revolutionary War alone, we had 6,800 Americans killed throughout the whole country, the whole colony, the original colonies. 1,000 alone came from Cape Cod. So 1,000 of our men. Uh, were killed in the Revolutionary War, leaving 202 widows and 342 orphan children. And one of the things that happened too after the, after the Civil War that was deemed a New Bedford would probably be a more appropriate site because they realized that Nantucket was kind of isolated. The people in New Bedford, there's only a limited supply of people that they can use. And by the way, the Indians, the Indians, uh, the indigenous people, 1750s, the indigenous people um, were dying in astronomical numbers. The, the Wampanoas, between the time of 1700 and 1750, more than 50 to 60 percent of entire tribes just wiped out by disease. So um, you've probably heard of um, you know the different people would come back from tribes and then they just wouldn't be there. Just would be nowhere to go. They'd come back and their tribes would be would be completely gone. So as a result, they had to find a different market 
And if, if even if you look now in New Bedford, there's still a lot of Portuguese. Many of the people have descendants from the Azores and the Portuguese people who became whale back in, in that time period. So how did New Bedford then become the whaling capital? Well, a few things happened. One of the first ones was a big, very influential man called William Rauch, his picture there. He first went to Hudson, New York, which is way up on the Hudson River. And he don't know why he thought that would be a great spot for it, but it wasn't a good spot, but he figured that would be a good spot to go. Um, New Bedford became the largest candle maker to the world. They were supplying half the candles to all of America. Um, Rodman candles, this man Rodman, who supported many whaling boats coming to um, to New Bedford was the owner of the Dartmouth, and that's the boat that was used on the Boston Tea Party. So you've probably heard of the Tea Party, of course. 1807, Jefferson passed a rule, an act called the Embargo Act. And he thought it'd be a great idea to have heavy shipping tariffs on cargo to England and France. As it turned out, it was not such a great idea. It was really a backfire. Um, he thought he can, the American government can get a lot of money from the you know, from the British and the Germans and anyone else wants to deal with us either way, buying or selling. Um, as it turned out, the whaling industry was, was shriveling up, they were dying. So as you could see the people kind of talking to Jefferson and saying, please, please rescind this act. So 90% of our boats will go out and we'd only get 25% return of investment after the, the embargo act. So it really was not a profitable situation for America. So embargo taxes uh, definitely at that time was not a, a grand idea to do. I would say the whaling industry probably reaches peak right around the 1840s, 1820 to 1856, I would say would be the, the highlight, the heyday of the whaling industry. Um, there were 900 whalers <clears throat> boats worldwide, 730 of them were American. It was the highest economical thing in America. They were second only to shoes and cotton. If you remember that, you know, the industrial age began right around 1840, textiles and, and you know, Lawrence and Lowell came on board. So that was big. Textiles were big and shoes were big and, <clears throat> and well, and those were the first three biggest industries in America. Up until the Civil War, those were really big things to do. They had sales in the millions of dollars. There's some sea captains who have logs and they, it, some individual captains had a log of over one or two million dollars. I mean, could you imagine how much money you could, or what you could do with money if you had a million dollars back in 1840? It was amazing with some of the, the wealth that some of these captains had, were able to acquire. And who made all the money, by the way, was well, the owner. So the ship, the typical ship, and I think I mentioned this before, but the owner of the ship who was financing all of that, he would normally get 30 to 40% of the profits right off the top. And then the captains would get maybe another 20%. And then they gave it to the crew. And like I said, the, unfortunately, the slaves and the indigenous people, um, not so much. They got a little bit of a profit, but not, not a great deal. Two interesting people I found out about who were involved in whaling. Um, but the Boston, Prince Boston was a slave who went on board a whaling ship and he was committed to sail for two years and he was not given his money. At the end of the crew, at the end of his, his, his indentured servant, he was told he was going to be paid money and he would be given his freedom. Neither happened. He had the audacity, which I think was great, to bring it to court, to a federal court. So Prince Boston brought his suit to court and the federal government found in his favor. So he was both awarded his salary and given his freedom. His, his nephew would be a fellow named Absalom Boston, who became the first black sea captain. He was out of province town. Some other famous people, you've probably heard of Edward Peniman. Have you been to the Peniman House? And you, if not, I definitely recommend you go. It's right here in East Town, open to the public. They're redoing the whole building. It's a, it's a great building to go through. They have tours every so often. The entire property is taken over by the National Park Service. So all the way, as you know, from Orleans, all the way, actually from East End, from actually from Chatham to a degree, Chatham all the way through Astor to Pita, um, it's all National Park land. So National Park Service does own his particular property. Even though he became one of the wealthiest men in the world, he retired at the age of 53, he hated paying taxes. He spent a total of over 11 full years at sea. He would go on two, three year voyages at a time. And his wife had normally go with him. His wife went on maybe 80% of his trips and the wife and children both. So there are pictures of him and his wife um, cooking on board and living on board. Um, it's really fascinating what, what they would do. But he, he decided to say, I could do it a little more, I'm not going to. He said, the reason I'm not doing this anymore, I'm paying too much in taxes. It goes, too much of my profit goes to the federal government. 
and I refuse, I just refuse to do it. Another popular sailor, his fellow from Provincetown, Captain Augustus Inglefell, the black captain. Um, as I said, you could really rise quickly in the whaling industry. That was one of the few places, you know, a harpooner was like a, was more than just a male. That, that was a pretty prestigious position. He could get a little bit of money. Food provider, cook and make a little more money. So the slave, you know, the indentured slaves or servants could actually move up pretty quickly. They could actually become a secondary, even a first mate in some cases. In Provincetown, they could become a captain. So it was a way for them to get some social mobility. Another fellow, so which I should mention really briefly, was Jonathan Bourne. The town of Bourne is named after him. Um, he was a benefactor. He, he actually began this. At the age of 15, he had one-tenth of one ship. And then every year thereafter, up until the age of 30, he kept on getting more and more uh, ships under his, under his bill. At the, at the end, he had almost 30 ships that he was responsible for the sponsoring. Made a tremendous amount of money. Very wealthy man, very well political man. So he ran for aldermen, ran for Congress here in Massachusetts. Um, one of the things that I read that he did, which was really interesting, Lincoln was almost not going to be nominated president. Um, but it turned out that he said, you know, Lincoln is anti-slavery. We need, we need Lincoln to, uh, to be our president. And so he sponsored him. He published the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which was, as you know, a series of seven debates that happened in Illinois. And Lincoln was kind of anti-slavery. It's kind of the sentiment of saying, we don't need to enslave people. And that became very popular. And that, that's what propelled him eventually that Lincoln did get the nomination. There was another whale, too. This is a real, a real thing called Mocha Dick. Now, when you think about Mocha Dick, it was a white whale, very large white whale. There was a book published about him in 1876, but he lived like in the 1830s, 1825, 1830. We know that this large whale, about 70 feet long, ran into at least a dozen different boats. He had it in for whales. He just, he knew what they were doing. He said, you're not going to get me, buddy. And he would ram them directly in the middle of the ship. And, you know, he was, he was a fighter. So that's one of the, one of the, some of the things. I would say the, the, uh, the more I did the, my research on whaling, I'm near the end of my presentation, but we're, we're closing in on now. But I would say three things stood out to me for Herbert Melville. Number one, the Mocha Dick story is, is not verbatim, but it's very closely related to the white whale. This mysterious animal that can knock boats over and he's, you know, he, comes, he sneaks and he comes and out of nowhere all of a sudden. Also, uh, Herman Melville, he was a sailor on a boat, the Kushnik, and they have a thing called the GAM. GAM is when two sailing boats or two fishing boats just meet, and for, for sometimes a day, two days, sometimes even three days, a GAM is when the sailors just go and chat to each other. So Melville, um, in 1840, was on the Christian and he met the captain for that first, remember the Essex, the first boat I showed you? The boat that was actually wet, uh, ran by the whale, and they had, they were really, really uh, eventually they came to cannibalism and, and all of that. Um, so that, that was, a, so he got his information from a lot of sea captains, from a lot of people who were there. So I would say that sparked his imagination, and that's, those, those are two of the origins probably of the Mocha Dick, uh, the Moby Dick story. Question all about scrimshore. Scrimshore art is a, a phenomenal thing. Very valuable today. If you have the real McCoy, some people buy scrimshore and they think they're buying the real thing. You have to have it dated. Certain pieces of ivory you know, have to be dated to that period. So you have to be careful when you do buy it. So why did uh, the whaling industry stop? Well, I'd say three main reasons. Number one, the technology became different in, in about 1920. Um, you know, the gas oil, I mean, the well, oil blubber was not used for lamps that much anymore. They had kerosene, they had gas lamps, they had you know, different ways of, of doing that. The Arctic fishing took a very rigorous toll. The number of whales that are available, um, you had to go really far, far, uh, almost to the, to the caps of the Arctic Ocean to, to capture whales. It is illegal in every country now in the world except three to capture a whale. Japan, Norway, and Iceland still allow whaling. Um, not supposed to, and maybe they're not being penalized that much, but those are the three countries that are still doing well. So that, that ends my presentation. I hope you hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, I'll entertain any questions if you have any questions. Hope you learned a little bit. Any Q and A? Comments, perhaps. Very good show. Thank you.
Thank you. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing the research. I enjoyed being the invited guest, too. So thank you very much for inviting me as a guest. Oh, that was terrific. Thanks a lot. Um, I've unmuted everyone if they want to, if you just want to um, go ahead and submit a question to Michael, um, certainly feel free to do so. You can unmute yourself. Turn your mics on if you have a question. How'd you get interested in this, Michael? Uh, well, I was always interested in history. I'm kind of not my major in college, but kind of my minor. Um, I began, as, as you probably know, then I felt like I played golf with, by the way. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I know. I know, I know you know a little bit about golf. The Captain's <laughs> Golf Course is actually how we, how we got interested. Captain's Golf Course has two golf courses, each hole is named after a captain. So there are 36 <laughs> captains. So I went to the golf pro and I said, you know, does anyone have any material on these 36 captains? He said, no one's ever researched it. So that was about four years ago. My first book, <laughs> I have to have two, one more in, in progress and one more coming out on Sea Captain of the Cape Cod. So the, the more I read, the more I got interested in, in, in this. Whaling just came up. I got that, in the beginning, my first book didn't concentrate on whaling at all. But the more I read about whaling, it became like a fascinating topic for me. Mm. I, found, I found very interesting, too, with how whaling evolved over time. Oh, we went you know, from Nantucket to New Bedford to, to Providence, you know, to, to P-Town. It's kind of interesting to see the different generations of whaling and how people made money and how the money was used. Uh, I know it's Christine raised uh, her hand. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to, if you have a question you want to ask. Okay, hi. This was awesome. So you said in Dennis there was a lot of shipbuilding. We're in Dennis today, where the sh where the uh, where, where that was happening. We were called the Shif Shifrack Boatyard. If you go to Corporation Beach, it's called Corporation Beach because there was a corporation there. So oh. There's about fifteen large boats would be come out of there almost every year. Right at the right where the beach is today. Right oh, the beach. What was yeah. the, the thing that I was talking about? The name of the thing. It might be out. Yeah, the chef, chef like both of us. You can do, you can Google that. You'll find out. It's, it's oh, so cool! Thank you so much. Sure. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I I do have a question. Um, so, oh, you know, you hear so much about Nantucket and uh, you know New Bedford in Massachusetts as being the major whaling centers for really all of North America. What, what are some other cities in the world that were major whaling ports? Do you know? Well, yeah, Long Island had Sag Harbor. That was a real big one. Sag Harbor's on the, on the West Coast. That became really big. Uh, near Baltimore, there are a couple near Baltimore. But they had to travel quite a bit to get up to the region where the whales were. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would say Montauk and Sag Harbor probably the, the next two biggest a uh, whaling center beyond that. Okay, thanks. But you can make lots of money. Some of the people, it was amazing how much money these gentlemen could make. Uh, Captain Tunneman, he was the richest man in, um, I think he was the richest man in America when he retired at the age of 53. Oh, wow. You could, That's crazy. <laughs> you could make some, some really good money. Uh, it's interesting that house is not nearly as opulent as some of the houses on Nantucket that belong to whaling captains. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at Nantucket, the homes are kind of right next to one another. I mean, his his sure. property extends, he had like acres, I mean, literally 100 acres of land, which went, went right to the bay to the ocean and went pretty much north to south. So he had quite a bit of territory that he. Oh, oh he owned all of Fort Hill then, probably. Pretty much, yep, he did, yep. Oh, wow, cool. Decent spot to own property. Not too bad. Wouldn't mind having it. <laughs> worth a few two dollars if you had that today. Yeah, right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning, but um, it does just happen sometimes. This technology is pretty new for most of us, um, and I would say I don't have it figured out a thousand percent either. So thanks for uh, bearing with us, and thank you, Michael, for your time very much. And um, we'll look forward to future presentations um, if you're interested.
Uh, in the meantime, I do want to share our next webinar. My pleasure, by the way. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to share our next webinar is on the urban heat island effect um, and what happens in neighborhoods that have a relative lack of tree canopies um, and the, the negative health outcomes that can come as a result. And uh, you see it in surprising areas, even including even on Cape Cod. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from uh, Charlie McCabe about that topic uh, next month. It's October 21st. Still plenty of time to register. Uh, there's the limit on these webinars uh, is 100. So find some people who are interested. <laughs> and uh, we look forward soon to sharing with you um, our, our topic for, for November. Um, and by the way, if you have any suggestions for things that you would be interested in here, topics you would be interested in hearing, um, please feel free to send me an email at any time. It's Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R-M, at DennisConservationLandTrust.org. You can also find my email on our website. Um, and please be sure to sign up for e-news if you're interested as well. So uh, I wish you all a terrific night. And uh, at this point, I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you very much, Michael. Real appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Very interesting. Stay well, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you.